start recording and the floor is yours as then. Okay, so um, do you see the presentation right now? I can see your screen. Yes, your yeah, but okay, diagnostically. Perfect. Thank you. So um, uh, many of you know that I have already done a harness for the C64 and also for the Vic 20. So what was still missing was a diagnostic thing for the pets. And um, it was a project going on for some time because I did not really, really know what to do with it. But uh, finally, I have uh, found out everything that I needed to know, and it was almost working. And uh, so I got a pet diagnostic clip, which is an original um, tool from Commodore. I got it working and released on GitHub. So may I introduce myself? My name is Sven Petersen. I was born in 1964. 65. Uh, yes, I'm an electrical engineer. I told that everything last time, so keep it short. And I have a couple of things on GitHub. I think uh, it is 55 repositories right now. And one of that is uh, the, the uh, diagnostic clip for PET. So, okay, the diagnostic clip is an original Pandora diagnostic tool. Uh, which uh, actually attaches to to the um, to to the uh, CPU to the 6502 with a clip cable, and it forces uh, the the computer to run the diagnostic uh, software on it, and it has uh, uh, like two dongles, which is a keyboard dongle and a user port dongle uh, to test the interfaces. Um, there are two hardware versions of the diagnostic harness, uh, 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 the, the diagnostic clip. One is for the non-CRTC uh, machines and one is for the CRTC machines. Those who have a dedicated uh, chip for controlling the CRT, the cathode ray cube. Um, also, there are a couple of versions. One is for uh, the uh, of, uh, versions of the software. One is for the um, uh, for for the non-CRTC body column pads. One is for the uh, forty column CRTC, like the uh, forty CBM forty whatever uh, thirty two, and one is for eighty column CRTC. Uh, oh, I misspelled that. <laughs> Um, one is for, for the 40 column uh, CRTC machines. Okay, so. Okay. So this is uh, a drawing of the original diagnostic clip set. I've taken it from testing the PET computer, which was issued in 1978. Um, it contains of a box. This box uh, holds an EEPROM, which is uh, the diagnostic software, and it uh, has this uh, diagnostic clip, which attaches to the 6502. And there are those two dongles I have already mentioned before. Um, the, the disadvantage of the clip is that it is actually not really reliable. I, I, I was told that uh, you sometimes you have to try it a couple of times before you can really start the the, the actual uh, software. Um, the the other thing is uh, the dip forty clip connector is quite expensive. I've looked it up a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, a model from DigiKey, uh, uh, a model from three M is like uh, ninety four dollars on on DigiKey. Um, the next thing is the dongles are hand wired, so you might make mistakes when you build them. Yes, so this is a picture of the original uh, diagnostic uh, set or diagnostic clip. This is, you can see here, it um, 
really clips on the CPU and the two dongles. I didn't take this uh, picture myself. Um, I found it on the internet and, and I got the permission to use it. Um, this is my development. It's a little bit different. I circumvent the use of the clip. I've made like a little adapter board which attaches uh, with a short ribbon cable and you, um, you install it in the CPU socket and you uh, install the CPU in the socket on the uh, on, on the adapter board. Um, the diagnostic the, the box uh, is a little bit different because it is more there's more things present there. Number one, you can switch between uh, non-CRTC and CRTC computers. Number two, you can select the firmware that you are running. Number three, it has a re no, the reset button was already on the original, but I have a switch for, for removing or activating the clip. That means you don't have to pull anything off. Uh, you just switch it off and then uh, uh, the software is running. The two dongles are not uh, wired out. They are just uh, using a PCB. And yeah, this is for the user port, which is closed, but you will see later how it uh, looks inside. So this is uh, inside of the diagnostic box. You have the EEPROM. Usually I put a label on it, but this is just for the photo. Um, you have the dip switch. You have the selector between, um, between uh, CRTC and non-CRTC, and you have... Uh, it's actually only a uh, 74LS20. Um, the original chip was, uh, the original box was using a 74LS138. Uh, so, and this is the switch that you use to remove uh, the clip virtually. This is uh, uh, the diagnostics clip installed inside uh, uh, a 3016. So this is a non-CRTC machine with uh, 16 kilobytes of RAM. Uh, you see the switch here is active. And later you remove it just by uh, yeah, sliding it over. Oh, and there's a keyboard dongle. The user port dongle can be seen in the back. And um, I still had something back in, in the cassette port, which doesn't matter. OK, so uh, this is something I didn't know before, uh, or not, not totally, or not in a way that satisfied me. You have to force the computer to run the software from, uh, from the EEPROM inside the box. So there are two methods, um, one for a CRTC pad and one for the non-CRTC pad. Um, the CRTC pads have a signal called NORON. This is attached to pin five of the uh, 6502, which is actually a not connected pin. So uh, you can use this to uh, get the signal from the box inside uh, the, the main board. And what it will do is it will switch off all EEPROMs. Uh, I didn't show the um, part of the schematic here because I think maybe it's a little bit too complicated, but you will switch off all EEPROMs inside the CRTC uh, main board and uh, the diagnostic software is executed at uh, the, the direct uh, addresses of dollar uh, f um, yeah xxx so the reset vector uh, which is uh, present in every kernel rom in every rom executed on uh, 6502 uh, is uh, located at uh, fffc and it points to FF uh, to to F zero zero zero, 
which is the start of the diagnostic software. And on reset, the diagnostic software is executed. Uh, the non-CRTC pads uh, don't have any uh, no ROM signal. So they do another trick, which is, uh, I'm not so really sure if I, I really like it, because it is just pull, uh, pulling the uh, address lines A13 and A14 to low, which means um, that, uh, yeah, it's like a short circuit of those two address lines. So a kernel access, which is actually at uh, $FXXXX is uh, redirected to $9XXX. Uh, this is, uh, you know, if you have a look at the binary, it is like 11111, this is F. And since you pull the two address lines low, you have 1001, which is $9. So that is actually where uh, an option ROM is present on a pet. So this is free address space. It will not collide with anything in case you don't have an option ROM installed. So the reset vector is this way located at $9 FFF, uh, FFC, and it points to $9800, uh, uh, which is like the beginning of a 2K EEPROM inside the diagnostic box and the diagnostic software in there will be uh, executed on power up or reset. So there are two parts of the diagnostic software. On reset, you just start the EEPROM software and it will do some very basic testing. It will uh, initialize the peripherals that you will need like uh, the PIA, the VIA and if there is one present in your machine, the CRTC. The video RAM will be tested. So when you run the test, you will see something running through uh, the, the, the uh, screen. And uh, the next, uh, the result is displayed on the uh, screen. The next is uh, testing the zero page which is uh, address space between zero and FF. And the next is, uh, you need this for running probably most software. And uh, the next important thing is the stack. Actually, it's more important because this is what you need to have uh, in, in case you are running a subroutine. You know, the address is stored on the stack and when the subroutine is ended, the address is, uh, gotten back from the stack so in case you don't uh, have this properly running you cannot run most of software okay so the next thing is the actual test software is copied to the ram at address 0200 and um, after it is copied it is verified that it is uh, properly copied so this part of the RAM is also tested. And then you see, remove the clip and is blinking. Uh, the software uh, that is running is actually monitoring the reset vector. So if it change, if, if you pull off the clip uh, or switch off the clip, uh, if you do that, you know, the original um, reset vector is appearing again. And the modified vector or, or that was uh, the, the vector from the diagnostic EEPROM is, um, is then gone and you see the original uh, uh, reset vector which is different. So if this happens, if this changes and this is uh, successfully changing for over a, an amount of like half a second or so, so you uh, uh, don't have any bouncing on when you pull off uh, the original clip or, uh, well, bouncing is not that much the problem when you switch it off a little bit, but, um, you know, so um, if this is uh, successful, 
uh, the actual test software will be running. So when I started the project, I just came to the screen and I saw remove the remove the clip and I thought, hey, this is over. That's all. And it took me a while to understand that I have to switch off the clip because I cannot remove it while the machine is running for further testing. So this is what you will see. This is um, on on an eighty column machine on my eighty uh, on my eighty thirty two. There are a couple of tests performed. One is the video test. Uh, then there's checksum test, horizontal video test, uh, which means it will, uh, yeah, it can detect the, uh, the horizontal and vertical sync pulses because they are on the uh, they are on the user port using that user port dongle. It will also test the RAM. It will do a checksum of the ROMs. I don't think it will really uh, show or it will complain if you have like your personal option ROM, uh, your personal kernel ROM, and that will not complain, I think. It will uh, test the refresh of the RAM, you know, because it's a dynamic RAM inside. And if it is uh, not refreshing properly, uh, you will lose content of the RAM over time. So it is like writing something into the RAM then waiting a bit. The keyboard test is easy because it's with the keyboard dongle. Uh, the 50 Hertz IRQ test that is, um, yeah, that's actually from the video. Uh, it will test the timers in the VR. It will test the cassette ports. Uh, the, the cassette or some cassette port signals are on the user port and they are uh, coupled in a certain way. So you can, um, recognize if those uh, signals are working. And the last is uh, the, the test of the IEEE bus, which is there is no dongle, no feedbacks. It is done internally. You know, you can like uh, write something and read it back without anything attached. So that is for the eddy column machine. Next is what it will look like on a 40 column machine. It is actually pretty much the same. As you can see, it is a little bit of different uh, screen layout and it will scroll. It will not uh, be static like uh, on an 80 color machine. So here's the user port dongle. And these are the feedbacks. So you see there's a, the TV video signal that is on the user port will be coupled back. Then the, the, the IEEE SRQ uh, will be coupled. This is actually a signal that um, that is not used by uh, current or uh, um, peripherals, but it is tested. And uh, my perfectly working 8032 had exactly this signal broken. So it took me a while before I could repair uh, my my 8032 to continue the test and to have this cycling, you know, the, the test software. There are a couple of other TV. Here you see the the, uh, the, the, the cassette port signals, which are all coupled. And here is um, the other TV signals on the user port which are actually good enough to generate a video on an, a, a suitable interface. So you can connect a monitor, an external monitor to your 40 column pad and uh, the 80 column needs a little bit of tweaking of the parameters for CRTC, but then you can also show a, a video signal on an 80 column machine. So this is the diagnostic keyboard dongle. I don't think that I have to really talk a lot about it. Commodore has a strange way to, uh, to number the pins on the keyboard connector. They are really weird, uh, which was, yeah, 
a bit confusing when I have done this project. So, and this is the ribbon cable adapter. The ribbon cable adapter was before just, you know, uh, pins to plug into the CPU socket, the socket on top, and a one-to-one -one connection of both and a one-to-one -one connection of, um, of the pins to uh, the ribbon cable connector, like here. Um, I did not like uh, the, the uh, oh, another typo. I did not like the A13 and A14 being hardly, uh, being pulled low by force. It was like, mm, I don't want this in my PC, uh, in, in my pet. So what I did was I added two end gates and they are using the no ROM signal that I have, uh, on the ribbon cable anyways, which has no effect in a non-CRTC pet. And I did this when it was high, uh, the end gates were transparent for the normal addresses. And when it was low, the output was low. And um, this way, uh, the A13 and A14 are gently forced to low and not brutally. This is um, a project which is not finished. It is uh, a little bit on hold. Um, somebody asked me if I could do a diagnostic clip for the 8030, uh, for the 8296, which is also like a CRTC machine with a little bit of extra uh, RAM and stuff. And it's a very nice machine. I don't have one though and I don't have the space to store one. Um, so uh, Christian asked me to um, to make it and um, he has shown me a couple of photos and I could recognize from the Commodore assembly number that it was the same board like on this uh, CRTC pet. So this should be working, I thought, and I made the dongles. Uh, they are also quite uh, primitive um, because uh, the wire, the wiring inside is on a PCB. And uh, yeah, the clip is actually the same. And there's a user port dongle, which is finally, uh, which is connected to the internal expansion port uh, J4. So that is what we have. So. Uh, yeah, this is what I already told you. Okay, so there's this breakout board for J4, which is connected via ribbon cable, because this is easier to build. Um, yeah, so there's a problem. The main problem is I don't have an 8296. So I uh, have to rely on my uh, cooperation partner. Um, what I was not aware of when I have done the project is that the 8296 can switch off its ROMs to access a RAM that is uh, below uh, the ROMs in the address space. So um, it can switch the no ROM signal um, with a register inside. Um, yeah, that requires a minor modification. I because I don't uh, pull off the diagnostic box; it will stay in place. I have to extra uh, yeah, disconnect the no ROM signal. So uh, if it switches the register, it does not uh, all of a sudden uh, have uh, the the diagnostic ROM in place of the kernel. Um, Finally, all dongles are working. They were tested with the original clip and it works. Uh, they were also uh, tested with one board with a modified box, it works too. And then the problem occurred. He had a second board he wanted to test it and it died. Uh, I suppose it is a, 
a broken CPU socket because uh, those sockets have never been really great. And if you install the, uh, the, the, the adapter board with the pins, uh, you are maybe producing a, a disturbance of the force and the socket finally breaks. That was my theory. So yes, here are some resources that I have used for making uh, this project. That was the diagnostic software I have uh, downloaded, or I have found it at uh, Bo Zimmerman's website. So yeah, we already heard about him today. The next, uh, he also had the information in some old chats uh, about the diagnostic uh, dongles. The next was the schematic of the box, a box that was uh, from André Fachat. Uh, he has uh, yeah, a page on, on 6502.org and I have found a bit of information there so I could finally uh, uh, fuse the PET version or the non-CRTC version and the CRTC version. Um, the next, after uh, I found out, I read uh, how it how it actually worked. I read uh, the uh, the forty or eighty service manual on from Retro Commodore EU. Um, then I have put some information about all that project and uh, how it was working on my website. And this project is on GitHub. Thank you for your attention. Many, many thanks to you, Sven. Uh, let me see if there are questions. I see comments. The switch was a great idea, definitely. <laughs> I love the fact that you built bugs on the target machine or the tools I have seen. I'm not doing No, that's true, indeed. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you want to comment on that. Uh, is it uh, the, the fact that it reports on the target machine and, and well, you know, indeed other other um, diagnostic uh, tools are, are usually like, then connected to another computer where you have, uh, then, then you display or, or you do the diagnostics from uh, from something else. How, yeah, why not uh, having taken that approach? Uh, is that something you have considered or? Um, my, my goal was actually to uh, recreate uh, the original Commodore tool, Commodore tool uh, which already existed. And that was like like uh, the same as with my um, with my uh, 60, 60, uh, C64 harness and with this uh, big 20 harnesses. This is like uh, recreating, the original Commodore uh, Commodore tools, and yeah, that's it. Actually, yeah. so uh, I mean, it is uh, no problem if you want to write your own test software and let it run on on the PET this way. And the PET has one disadvantage: that is, it does not have like a cartridge slot like the C sixty four and the VIC twenty. So if you want to connect something to the internal bus, uh, which is uh, possible, you even have to uh, generate your own supply voltage because it only offers like seven volt uh, DC or nine volt DC inside and you have to have your uh, power conditioning. So you have uh, five volt or whatever you want to use inside your uh, hardware. Um, to run it. So, well, it's not like uh, in a PET, you know, where you, uh, not like in a C64, where you plug in your uh, diagnostic cartridge and let it run, or whatever cartridge and let it run. It is a little bit more complicated. complicated. Good. Thank you. Uh, I see you, you, you might have already a customer here. I see a comment from Jessica. I could have use that diagnostic when repairing my my 4032 pet great project mm -hmm. <laughs>
Yeah, good. Um, yeah, maybe that, that that's also a good transition to my, my next question. So your so the the I guess the hardware design and the software is on is on your GitHub, but then not everybody is good at building a hardware, right? I think you mentioned it uh, yourself at the beginning that the wiring is uh, usually quite uh, can be quite tricky. So is you know, I, is that also available somewhere for 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 yeah just for for sales somewhere with uh, I don't know maybe actually you not a, because I uh, I'm I'm not really selling anything other than um, yeah maybe prototypes that are leftovers um, it does not fit with my text model <laughs> it not no, with my you know sometimes there are some some. Uh, some small, uh, or, but if or somebody would companies. like to, but if yeah, somebody would like to build it, I will offer every support I can. Yeah, that's good to hear. Yeah, this is I have done yeah. it with a C64 harness, I have uh, uh, made a version out of uh, SMD parts, which uh, the gentleman in the retro computers has uh, seen don't like to solder, but the machines can uh, do it much better than uh, through hole components. And it will be cheaper this way, or it is cheaper this way. So I have uh, done something that every, actually that everybody could build the harness. Uh, for the, for the, um, diagnostic clip I don't have anything like this because it does not really make sense there's not so much um, on the on in the bar in the box and uh, the actually the, uh, the adapter is uh, the CPU adapter is already SMD I mean there's a little I see in there I couldn't uh, use a bigger one or I didn't want it or whatever uh, so yeah, everybody who wants to build, I will offer my uh, support. Yeah, that's good to know. Many thanks for that. Uh, I think something absolutely amazing, I think is the 80, the clip for the 8296 that you don't have one, but you're still able to build one. <laughs> and okay, have it, have it tested. By yeah, I was, uh, with, with, I was uh, provided with the information required. Somebody had the original harness. Uh, or, or the original dongles, and um, he he me uh, measured it out. So I uh, I knew what was inside, and he read out the EEPROM. So I was running the EEPROM on my AD32, which works partly because it does not completely offer the same hardware, but it is partly the same. So uh, um, yes. It worked, uh, so I said, okay, so I can send him the the stuff and he could try it out on his machine. Unfortunately, his second machine died, which is, uh, yeah, the reason for the delay of the project. Good, I'm looking at the, if there are any questions on Facebook, I just see thanks, Van, for your support of the retro hardware communities. Yeah, but no question. Uh, is there any other question from the, the attendees in the call? If not, then again, many, many thanks, Van. I will stop the recording now. Okay, bye.